My name is Andrea Ray, and I have the pleasure to serve as the President CEO at the Seattle Southside Chamber. And on behalf of our board and our staff, welcome to our SMART Southside Mitigation and Recovery Task Force webinar on transportation in the new world. While still in the midst of the vast human and economic impacts our world has faced as a result of COVID-19, our country now reels from the tragic loss of George Floyd and numerous others as a result of racism. Even more than before, we are challenged to maintain the semblance of business as usual, a challenge that is especially trying for our communities of color and primarily the black members of the Southside community and beyond. We at the chamber understand this as an organization and as individuals. We must fight for equity, justice, and understanding that our lives and our success as a community are bound together. It's as a community that we must unite to demand and bring about necessary change. More importantly, now we are stronger together. I wanna to thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for allowing us a moment to acknowledge our truth. We also want to take a moment and thank our sponsor, South King Media. Scott and Teresa Schaefer have been tireless advocates for our community. As a small business themselves, they are dedicated to helping other small businesses grow as well as keeping our community connected and informed. Through technology, we are now broadcasting live on Facebook so that even more people are able to join us and ask questions and participate. So thank you again, Scott. Each week, SMART will present a new topic on a subject impacting our community. Next week, we hope you'll join us as we look at what the impacts of COVID have been for our minority and refugee business owners. You can register for all of our webinars on our website, seattlesouthsidechamber.com. We know providing opportunities to share information and connect will make our community stronger and ready for recovery. We hope you can join us for more of these opportunities. And if you or your company is able, to donate or sponsor our work so that we can continue to serve our community in and through this challenge, it is greatly appreciated. Every little bit helps, even a dollar brings us closer to recovery and helps keep our nonprofit strong and able to serve our community. Thank you. And so it's my honor to introduce the first presenter and also facilitator uh, for this morning's conversation, Bruce Agnew. Since 1993, Bruce has been leading the Cascadia Center in Seattle. The center is a private, nonprofit public policy center engaged in regional and international transportation and technology. Bruce also co-chairs the transportation group for the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, a public-private partnership of 10 Northwest states and Western Canadian provinces and territories. Since 2017, he has served as director of ACES Northwest Network, dedicated to acceleration of ACES Autonomous Connected Electric Shared Technology and Transportation. The network is a 40-member technology-driven alliance, co-chaired by Tom Alberg, co-founder and managing partner of Madrona Adventure Group in Seattle, and Brian Mistily, CEO, co-founder of Inrex Global Technology in Kirkland. Bruce, thank you so much for being here to present and facilitate the conversation today. Uh, over to you. Bruce, sir, you are muted. Do you mind unmuting yourself? There, we there you go. are. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Um, on a personal note, I want to thank Renata and Andrea for helping our ACES group put together an ACES for All seminar uh, in Des Moines last year. And she brought to get, they brought together a great panel of hospital folks and social service and disability advocates to talk about how we could accelerate technology in South King County 
Um, it was a great session. We, we looked at wor uh, low-income worker and family access to child care, medical centers, and food outlets. And I think it's the beginning of a good partnership uh, as we move forward. Um, next slide. These uh, are some of the remarkable constellation of technology companies that are operating in our area, sometimes quietly. Obviously, the, the big ones, Microsoft, Amazon, T-Mobile, Verizon, you've got uh, a whole bunch of uh, smaller companies that the public doesn't recognize, but they are involved in this uh, remarkable uh, effort to accelerate technology in our region. And then when we partner that with the Gates Foundation, the Allen Institute, Fred Hutch, UW, and others, we've got a pretty powerful opportunity to accelerate transportation technology. Next. Okay, and the, focusing a little bit on transportation, you can see that we've got um, a, a variety of companies from PACCAR and trucking and freight to Google and INREX. Um, Renata talked about Tom Alberg and Brian Misterly. I, I just want to say uh, Brian is the uh, CEO of uh, INREX, which is a remarkable company in Kirkland that has become a global uh, transportation data and, and navigation company. And uh, uh, Brian brings a unique perspective. You may have read about INREX in the newspaper when they cover traffic delays around the country. And of course, Tom Alberg, many of you recognize Tom. Um, Tom just retired from the board of directors at Amazon where he served for 22 years and he was probably one of the first investors in, in Jeff Bezos at Amazon and believed in his uh, efforts to start an online bookstore. Uh, Tom's been a great leader. Next. Okay, let's look at the elements of ACES as, uh, as Renata uh, talked about, or I mean, uh, uh, Andrea talked about. Autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. For us, we'll start with S. Uh, shared mobility represents an opportunity for transit partnerships for first and last mile transit center access with private transportation providers and um, via Uber, Lyft, and nonprofits like Hopelink. It also represents an opportunity um, to expand employer shuttles and van pools. Now, pre-COVID, we were seeing expanded fleets for tech companies such as Microsoft, Expedia, T-Mobile, Amazon, and Google. Now those vans are transporting food um, as companies explore how soon to bring employees back to work. I think the uh, average um, tech company that had employer shuttles had about 12% of their employees that would uh, use the employer shuttles. Electrification. All of us, I think, have appreciated the, the beautiful skies that we see today be based on the lower emissions from vehicles and the economic lockdown. Electrifying transportation for personal and freight mobility can help us keep the air clean. And one of the topics I'd like to explore with the group is the relationship between uh, COVID and climate change, particularly in low-income communities. So we'll bring that up, bring that up later. ACES is... Um, Relying, frankly, on the leadership of um, Puget Sound Energy um, in developing uh, public charging stations around their service area. They've really stepped up and have organized themselves and worked with their customers to determine their needs. We envision a system in the future of supercharging stations uh, relying on new technology along the I-405 SR18 and 167 quarters for use by public and private fleets. These would include next. These would include employer shuttles, rideshare companies, and delivery vans, as well as municipal and transit fleets, wheelchair vans, which was a topic at our Des Moines session, and even school buses. Metro has an aggressive schedule to electrify their fleet. And I think Bill will probably mention that. The corporate commitments by Amazon with 100,000 electric de delivery vans on order and Microsoft to decarbonize their operation provides a great leverage and an opportunity for us to marry public uh, funding, corporate funding, and philanthropic funding for electrification. Now, the, the C in ACES stands for connected. 
Sensors on connected cars gather a lot of data, which is presented to the driver or used by the vehicle to generate an autonomous response to the situation for safer operations for both drivers and pedestrians. Cities that expedite internet fiber and small cell 5G networks can dramatically reduce the time to transmit the data. In the industry, they call it latency. COVID has shown us the importance of increased internet access. I think that'll be discussed in today's session also, particularly in low income communities, as well as faster speeds for internet service. More investment in digital infrastructure will enhance telecommuting, education, and telehealth. Taken together, the benefits of ACES and accelerating transportation are fairly clear. First of all, increased safety and the reduction in accidents and congestion. Electrifying transportation will reduce the costs and carbon. Shared mobility partnerships with social service agencies and transit will enhance access for low income. Next. Now, Bellevue is an interesting case study. Uh, they have a smart mobility plan that they adopted in 2018. And I think it serves as a blueprint for other cities. It, it helps that the voters of Bellevue recently approved a technology levy to implement things like coordinated traffic lights, new bike lanes, and management of the curb space for multiple uses in front of office buildings, well, which is increasingly an issue in downtown Seattle and Bellevue as we see an increase in transit, employer shuttles, ride share, and then you have overlay that with with bike paths and the need for enhanced wheelchair accessibility, the curb becomes very crowded very soon. And so Bellevue is taking a hard look at how they might maximize and, and make more efficient the use of that curb space. Um, we secured the endorsement of about 30 Eastside and South King County companies for a federal grant application for something called Commute Pool. Um, this was designed to encourage the next generation of employer shuttles, which would be electrified, coordinated with transit stops, as well as providing direct home to work routes in uh, far flung suburban areas where, where we don't have transit service. And ultimately these vans would be autonomous, uh, but initially with a safety driver. Post COVID, uh, the challenge will be uh, modifying these vans, uh, compartmentalizing them to secure social distance, distancing among the passengers, as well as an aggressive schedule for cleaning. Next. So um, to sum up, we've got um, a, a, a commitment by companies to, that are dedicated to reducing employer, employees driving alone to work. And I think the tech companies of the region have done a remarkable job in, in uh, addressing those goals. And you connect that with transit agencies, van pools, and now new shuttles um, that will have to adjust to the social distancing and health and safety protocols. I also think it's not listed here, but uh, anecdotally, we're seeing uh, a major increase in, in biking and electric bikes for, for commuters. So I think you'll see that as more part of the, of the commute pattern in the future. Every crisis represents an opportunity. So Let's take advantage of the improving battery technology that reduces vehicle costs and extends ranges and makes electric vehicles more attractive to people and fleet managers. With delivery fleets, I mentioned Amazon, you've got FedEx and UPS also going electric, the timing is perfect. Now, what's an interesting phenomenon has been the robot delivery services to minimize human contacts um, They've been accelerated during COVID. Many uh, medical facilities are using robots to move products on campus to protect and make more productive healthcare workers. We're also seeing more discussion about robots for deliveries of packages and food. And that's just on the surface. Looking into the sky, the increased use of drones for high value cargo and the testing of electric airplanes made by local companies in Redmond and Seattle for regional deliveries out of SeaTac holds great promise. Um, getting back to that constellation of technology companies, we are a, a great resource for global innovation locally. And I think there's a great new opportunity for people who are now unemployed to be retrained through extra workforce training to, um, 
to get a new job and a new career perhaps. And, and for us, that is a sign of success, but it's also a discussion for another day. So I'm gonna turn it over to a good friend, a King County Council member, Dave Updegrove, who was born and raised in Burien and represents the South King County for 12 years in the State House of Representatives and was a member of the House Transportation Committee where I got to know him. He currently serves on the King County Council and is a member of the Sound Transit Board and he's gonna give us a deeper look at the impact of COVID on transit. Dave? Thanks, Bruce, and uh, thanks, Andrea Renata, for hosting this today. Um, like Andrea, I want to acknowledge that we're hosting this seminar in some challenging times. We've had over a thousand King County residents have lost their lives to the COVID virus, and we also are in the, the midst of uh, a robust national discussion about um, kind of our history and legacy uh, of racism in this country. And I think to acknowledge that. We're, we're having this conversation in this context is important. Um, you know, Sound Transit is an important part of the public infrastructure that supports businesses and jobs here in the South End. And for example, light rail makes it easier for tourists to stay at SeaTac hotels and still attend events in Seattle. And uh, the Sounder train service in Tukwila connects people to Pierce and Snohomish County. and thanks to some new investments in bike and pedestrian connections, as well as uh, Metro Rapid Ride Line. Uh, that Tukwila station, I think, is part of the reason we're seeing some new development in the South Center area, east of the mall. And obviously, a lot of service employees rely upon Sound Transit to get to their jobs at the airport and surrounding communities. So this is a part of the economic engine. But just like those of you in the private sector, Sound Transit has been hammered by this health pandemic. Ridership is down 86%, I'll repeat that, 86%, meaning we have 14% of the ridership we did prior to the pandemic. Um, and Sound Transit completely suspended fares during this time um, for health reasons. Uh, in addition to the loss of the fare revenue, the tax revenue that Sound Transit relies upon to operate and build out our system has also been dramatically reduced and in large part because the most significant source of funding is the sales tax. And we know how sales are going right now. So Sound Transit is projecting that for 2021, that's just this year and next, that our loss in tax and fare revenue is about $1 billion, give or take a little bit, depending on the severity of the recession. And I know a lot of folks have saw in the paper, oh, the federal government bailed out transit agencies. Well, the Federal CARES Act is providing $166 million to the agency in one-time funds. So even taking the federal assistance into account, we're looking at a $750 million to $1 billion shortfall just for the remainder of this year and next. And I think uh, most economists you know, try to predict, but it's tough to predict how long and how deep a recession will be. Uh, but we are having to prepare for some potentially very difficult scenarios in the out years as well, ranging from eight to $12 billion um, less revenue uh, coming in than was anticipated. Um, the agency has a responsibility, a legal responsibility to deliver the projects approved by voters. And the agency is authorized to collect the taxes until the projects are paid for. So it really becomes an issue of timing. Uh, and one of the tools the agency has always had in order to build projects in a timely manner is to borrow money and pay it off with the future taxes. That is, we issue bonds in order to have cash now for construction and then pay them off over many years. And that's common practice in public and private sector for major capital projects. Uh, but importantly, state law limits the amount of debt that local governments, including Sound Transit, can take on at any one time. And we don't have a lot of room to take on much more debt. <clears throat> so the primary budget tool Sound Transit has is to delay expenditures. In other words, delay the construction of planned projects. And so the Sound Transit Board of Directors has already embarked on a process to develop and select options for adjustments to our uh, long range plan. As we do that, there's some principles and, and things we're considering. I'm gonna run through them very, very quickly. 
to give you a sense of the types of questions the board will be examining as we look to adjust the plan. Uh, we're gonna look to what were the core principles of Sound Transit 3. And they were completing the spine, connecting centers, ridership potential, socioeconomic equity, and advancing logically beyond the spine. Uh, we're also gonna look at uh, program affordability. Is the full program affordable at this level? We're also gonna look within the different sub areas, the different geographic areas, is the program affordable with, within the revenue of that sub area? Uh, and some of the other project consideration board members may be taking into account are things like, how important is the project to operating our current and new service? Um, is the project necessary for other projects to happen? Can the project be built in increments? How close is the project to opening for service? How long have voters been waiting for the project? Do communities the project serves have other transit options? And are there other funding sources available or secured? So we have a, a difficult job ahead of us. But what does it mean for South King County, for members of uh, Seattle Southside? Uh, the good news is I feel very confident that light rail to Federal Way will remain on track, no pun intended, will remain on track for opening in 2024. And as you recall, this will include stations at Highline College, 272nd Street, and the Federal Way Transit Center. And this is likely to proceed on schedule given how far along it is already with construction and also because it has significant federal funding um, that we made commitments as part of that funding. You know, I also feel confident that the new bus rapid transit from the Berrien Transit Center through Tukwila Station up 405 is likely to remain on schedule, at least the south portion of it. And I think that's good news. That's going to provide frequent and much faster bus service um, for folks from Berrien and uh, Tukwila who are heading north, uh, thanks to uh, dedicated lanes. Uh, another major plan investment in South King County is improvements to the Sounder train service heading south. And I'm hopeful that the plans for increased capacity, that is more cars per train, I think those are likely, but I think if we're gonna see delays in investments in the South King area, <clears throat> you know, I would, I think the most likely place to look would be in the plans for adding additional sound transit uh, train trips. So cars per train increasing likely, number of trips increasing, um, I think is more likely where we may see those delays because those are, it's very expensive to negotiate additional trips with BNSF on those rail lines. And, and so uh, there also were two projects in the previous sound transit ballot measure um, that were delayed for years, but finally got restarted last year and are finally on the brink of going to construction that are now at risk again. And those are parking garages at the Sounder stations in Kent and Auburn. And those were promised to the voters and are top priorities for those cities. And so the Sound Transit board members from South King County, um, we were meeting regularly. We've identified those as a critical priority for us to protect. I want to finish by shifting gears a little and talking about uh, plans to start ramping up service. As you know, because of the massive drop in ridership, we reduced light rail service. So trains have only been running every 30 minutes. Uh, on June 1st, a few days ago, we increased service so that trains are now running every 20 minutes on weekdays, still only 30 minutes on evenings and weekends. Definitely check the website for details and changes. Uh, we have resumed fare collection, but at a reduced rate, $1 for light rail, two bucks for the train. And because we uh, are still facing challenges from the COVID-19, all transit staff will continue to wear face masks. Passengers are asked to wear face coverings consistent with public health guidelines. Riders should follow social distancing and other health guidelines and limit travel to essential trips. Sound Transit is also continuing an expanded cleaning program of disinfecting vehicles and facilities with a particular emphasis on places like ticket vending machines and other high touch areas like guardrails. And so to conclude, while the agency has challenges ahead, we will manage them responsibly. And I am actually hopeful that the significant construction activity and the related jobs and economic activity associated with the sound transit expansion is gonna be a little bit of an engine that helps our region spring back to life once this pandemic is behind us. And that this important piece of our transportation infrastructure 
will uh, allow our region and South King County in particular to be competitive and better positioned for economic success as we move forward. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, Dave. Well, I think we all appreciate your relentlessly positive uh, perspective and looking forward because we've heard so okay. many uh, stories that upset us about the cuts in transit service or potential cuts in the, in the ridership. And we know, in, particularly in your district, how important transit is for, for service workers um, in particular. So, uh, and it's a great segue to Bill Bryant, who is the Managing Director of Service Development at King County Metro where he oversees Metro scheduling, transit, route facilities, rapid ride, and service planning teams. Prior to joining Metro in July of 2016, um, Bill was uh, managed transit projects, programs, and services um, at the Seattle Department of Transportation. Bill? Yes, good morning, good afternoon. Good morning, thank you, Bruce. Uh, it is still morning. Uh, and I really appreciated Council Member Uptegrove's um, description of the challenges that um, Sound Transit's facing. And many of Metro's challenges are very similar. I won't go into the same level of detail regarding um, our financial outlook, but suffice it to say that we are, uh, we are verging on crisis at this point. And that, that's true of the transit industry across the board. Um, next slide. Thank you. So Metro responded quickly when the pandemic hit in March. Uh, we've made a lot of service reductions. We have uh, done so in a way that's designed to continue to provide a viable transit network um, and service levels. Um, back when we first started to cut service immediately after the pandemic hit, uh, we did so in anticipation of, of a, re a reduction in bus operator availability, mechanics, service workers, and others. Um, but those service reductions also really matched the drop in demand. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that demand, drop in demand has looked like uh, in a few minutes. But nearly all routes in the system have been reduced to some extent. Uh, many routes are fully suspended, especially those peak only commuter routes. Um, those obviously are the transit customers who are most likely to be able to telecommute. And for most large employers downtown, that telecommuting rate has essentially been uh, 100%. Um, also, we did start to roll out a little bit of new, or reintroduce, I should say, a little bit of bus service in April, and we will be doing that again later in June um, with the target date of June 22nd for some modest additional service to come back on the street. And of course, like Sound Transit, we are requiring customers and employees to wear masks. Um, and, uh, and we've had pretty good compliance. It's not an easy uh, requirement to enforce, so there's uh, not an active really enforcement effort, but our communities have really been showing that they understand the need to do that. Next slide. Um, so Metro and Sound Transit and other uh, transit agencies basically were serving up until the pandemic hit 50% of all the riders to downtown Seattle. And the percentage uh, in South King County is even a little bit greater. But on a typical day, we would have 420,000 riders. Now that's down to about 110,000. I think we hit bottom at, um, at one point we were at about 25% of normal ridership. Uh, that is slowly creeping up just over the last couple of weeks. But almost more importantly, you know, our buses with the social distancing requirements can only carry between 12 and 18 people. And these are buses that when fully loaded with people standing in the aisles, normally would have been able to hold between 50 and 80 people. Um, the number of seats on these buses is approximately uh, 35 to 50. And so this has played a, a much bigger role in our capacity drop than the drop in service has. Uh, and you can see from these figures that, you know, we have we have a little bit over half of the number of buses on the road 
at the peak period, which is the afternoon rush hour um, at 770 buses versus over th uh, 1300 under normal conditions. Next slide. Um, this graph just shows the ridership drop. I apologize if the colors are a little bit difficult to see, but the top two lines represent um, Metro bus and Metro access paratransit, which have seen similar trends, but towards the current date, and I think this data is actually, uh, was updated two days ago. Um, you can see the little creep up in ridership as June started. But you can also see from this chart, the um, bottom line is the King County Water Taxi, which is a very, very um, commuter heavy service. And that's down roughly 90%. And you can also see the next line above that is Sound Transit Express Bus, which is also a very commuter heavy um, service. And that's down some 80% plus or minus. Next slide. So South King County is uh, a little bit more of a transit, uh, has a bigger transit customer base than much of the rest of the county. Um, and there is some good news down in South King County, which is that uh, this part of the county is likely to be the last to get a large amount of new bus service for quite some time, given the economic outlook. And starting September 19th of this year, there will be 18,000 hours annualized service hours of bus service added to South King County. So that's really good news. That adds some frequent service throughout the day that will make transit easier to use. But it's a bit of a difficult message because at the same time, we're making um, big cuts uh, across the county. Ridership is down quite a bit less in South King County than in any other quadrant of the county, I would say. And that really matches the demographic. And I'll show a demographic slide um, in it's one or two slides down the road. But um, we've seen, I'll use an example where very commuter heavy markets, such as West Seattle, for example, um, have seen ridership drop by about 85 to 90%, while the rest of the county on average has been closer to uh, a 75% drop. But South King County, many of the South King County routes have lost more like, uh, or I should, I'll look at it on the bright side, have been able to retain uh, 40 and even 50% of riders on, on certain routes. And that's largely because of the off-peak demand of South King County. Um, one other unique attribute of South King County that has really come into focus um, during the pandemic is the, um, the fact that all of the commuter routes that run from South King County into downtown Seattle uh, run on I-5 for at least a part of the route. And as traffic was starting to hit its peak, uh, you know, late last year, uh, that congestion was really, really affecting South King County commuter routes. And Council Member Updegrove's office, you know, heard a regular stream of comments about that congestion and about the delays to buses. Well, then the pandemic hit and that traffic dried up. And I'll talk a little bit about, a little bit more about that and what opportunities that might provide in a couple of slides. Next slide, please. Um, this, this slide just illustrates some of the work that King County Metro has done to identify the demographics that are most dependent on transit. Metro is very unique in that over 70% of our riders, probably closer to 80%, do have access to a car. And um, at the same time, though, we are expanding our focus on serving those who um, are really a little more dependent on transit. And this map shows in blue sort of a compilation of low incomes, populations of color, and uh, populations of people with disabilities. Next slide. This slide illustrates, and it's, there's actually quite a bit here in these two graphs, um, and I won't dwell on it for too long, but uh, on the left, you see the, by time of day, on the lower axis is the time of day, and 
Uh, the lines on the chart represent the amount of travel that happens during each hour of the day. And you can see that for non-transit modes, it's one big lump in the middle. For transit in King County, it's always been very peak heavy. And this shows that in the morning and afternoon peaks, Metro has about twice as much service on the street as we do during the midday. That was before the pandemic. The two lower lines on the right-hand graph are current, um, or perhaps a few weeks old, I believe. And those lines um, show that that curve has really flattened. And the same would be true if I were showing you weekday versus Saturday and Sunday, where the amount of ridership on weekends has come much closer to what we're seeing on weekdays. And that again reflects the non white collar uh, commuter market, as well as the market for all other types of trips, shopping, medical appointments, everything else people do in their daily lives um, happening as a larger percentage of trips than commuters. The, um, the graph also divides it into more educated populations and less educated populations. And those, the, the blue is the um, more educated and the white is the, or the yellow is the less educated. Next slide, please. So this current situation is truly an amazing case study for, certainly for transit nerds and professionals like me. Some of us are both transit nerds and transit professionals, but the way that we and other transit agencies across the country respond to this um, pandemic and to the change that we're gonna be seeing in commute patterns over the next couple of years is uh, really an amazing opportunity for a reset. Uh, you know, the funding challenges are extremely real. A at the same time that our revenues are dropping, the city of Seattle's uh, funding, which covers the cost of about 10% of our entire bus system is ending at the end of this year, um, just adding to the challenges of the sales tax revenue drop and the fare box revenue drop. Uh, we haven't been collecting fares since the pandemic started in order to keep riders separate from bus operators. We do uh, plan to continue to not collect fares through June, but there likely will be resumption after that. The changes in traffic patterns that I mentioned earlier, uh, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because the, uh, you know, the demand for street space has dropped so tremendously with the pandemic that at the same time, buses are getting through very reliably. Uh, we're looking forward and thinking, how do we continue to carve out the transit priority space and the bus lanes that we really need when traffic returns to normal to keep, to keep buses moving? Nobody knows what the traffic patterns are going to look like when the economy starts to pick back up. And then of course, there's the telecommuting trends that we're seeing and the likelihood that many, many more people will telecommute and that that demand curve that I showed you is likely to stay flatter than it has been in the past. Next slide. This just shows that um, Metro provides a pretty broad range of mobility services. We are no longer just about fixed route transit. We have many partnerships with Via and Uber and other private providers to try to get towards that first mile, last mile market that Bruce mentioned. And um, our ability to have that kind of partnership is really gonna be compromised going forward until the economy recovers and our revenue recovers. And that economic outlook is also likely to affect our progress towards electrifying our bus fleet. We've been making great strides in planning for um, an all electric bus fleet within about 15 years. And that's real, that is, a very expensive proposition and it, I can pretty much guarantee that it will be called into question, at least the pace of that will be called into question as the budget reality settle in. So I think that's all I have.
and I'll look forward to questions at the end of the panel discussion. Thank you. Well, Bruce, please unmute yourself. Sorry. Sorry, folks, I keep forgetting to unmute. I get the video going, but I don't get the mute going. I, I wanted to thank Bill for a, a great presentation. The points about uh, changes in transit service and resetting the agency, um, the commitment to electrification, um, and the great unknown of, a, of additional um, adjustments because of telecommuting in terms of employees' uh, schedule. When you marry that with um, uh, affordable housing issues where folks are you know, commuting greater distances to find affordable housing, it's gonna be a, a very uh, interesting world in the next uh, year or so. So our final panelist is Nick Abel, and Nick is a senior transportation specialist at Commute Seattle. One of, I think one of the premier uh, nonprofit transportation management uh, associations in the country. They really do a great job in connecting employers, um, the city, the transit agencies, ferry system to allow uh, folks multiple options to get into uh, downtown. Um, and I'm particularly intrigued that uh, Nick works with small businesses, which have been obviously severely impacted um, uh, in this last uh, three months to help support their um, employees to gain access to commuting options. So I'm interested to get the perspective of, of um, from you, Nick, about um, and with a focus on the small business um, people. Nick? Thanks for that introduction, Bruce, and thank you, uh, Renata and Andrea, for having us be a part of this. Um, excited to tell you guys a little bit uh, about a survey that we did recently, but first I wanted to talk a little bit more about transit capacity, um, at least in the, the through the lens of uh, Metro buses. Um, Bill did a really great job of covering that, but I also have a few visuals that I think are helpful. So next slide, please. Um, so this is the crowding capacity on a typical 40-foot bus from Metro. Uh, they say 51 riders. I was a uh, D-line commuter before the COVID pandemic hit, and I think anyone that has ridden a bus during uh, peak commuting hours would tell you that there are more than 51 people that can fit on one of these. Um, there, And so, um, next slide, please. So to maintain the appropriate social distancing, Metro estimates that you can have 12 people on a bus. And this is a visual aid for what that would look like. So that's roughly 24% of what the crowding threshold was previously. Um, and when you combine that with the roughly 30% transit uh, service reduction that Metro has implemented, we're talking about an incredibly limited options on public transportation going forward um, during COVID. And, and as we um, start to ramp up through phase one, two, three of, of um, this pandemic, we're going to see more people that are interested in going back to public transportation as a commuting option. That's been the number one question that we've received from the employers that we work with, just as they're planning to potentially re return to the office or reopen, they say, you know, what are the options for public transportation? Um, so we're looking at not only uh, less frequency, but um, a lot of, of buses having to pass up commuters potentially just to maintain these social distancing. Um, Metro is currently uh, seeing about uh, 73, 75% reduction in ridership, but that's still over 100,000 people that are riding the bus every day. And those are people that are essential workers. Those are people that are transit dependent for their transportation needs to either go to um, doctor's appointments, um, other appointments, grocery store. And so uh, when thinking about returning to the office or returning to public transportation, you also have to keep in mind the equity lens there that, um, there are people that are dependent on transit every single day for a multitude of reasons. And anyone who is returning to transit um, from a telework setting is potentially taking away a transit seat from someone who really needs it for their day-to-day -day life. Next slide, please. So at Commute Seattle, we have had to really pivot a lot of our, our thinking and services. We're very, previously very, um, focused on public transportation, active commuting, carpooling, van pooling, as well as telework. But um, if you look at the, the mode split in our city, the majority of people are taking public transportation to get downtown. 
Um, so as this this pandemic hit, we had to really think about what are what is what are people struggling with right now? What are businesses having to do to make this adjustment, and how can we support them? We thought the best thing to do would be to um, conduct a survey just to understand who was able to do what, what where are the pain points for uh, employers and what can we do to help? So we uh, conducted a survey that closed about two weeks ago. We sent it out to about 4,000 businesses in the greater Seattle area and we're really happy to have over 400 respondents. Um, and this survey really just looked at um, who has been able to make a pivot to telework, what has that experience been like, and what are your plans going forward? So of the over 400 respondents, uh, we had um, over 20 different industries uh, 16, a little under 16% of those were tech, but other than that, um, the other 19 industries, had, it was pretty well spread across. Uh, everyone was between 8 and 3%, so we were really happy to have a diverse um, feedback from respondents there. Also, as you can see, right around 60% of respondents were businesses uh, that we define as small, so less than 100 employees, and 35% of those had one to 20 employees. So really small businesses throughout the area. Um, we think that's really valuable information, not, not only to just get a, a variety of feedback, but also a lot of large businesses will have their own transportation teams or transportation specialists who is able to really implement thought out plans and best practice as businesses phase up for a return to the office. Small businesses typically don't have that. So these were a lot of respondents that are really gonna be seeking um, information and guidance from an organization like ours. Next slide, please. So this is an incredibly telling slide that, um, uh, so first we asked, which best describes your organization's work culture, work from home culture prior to COVID and then post COVID. And as you can see, prior is pretty telling. Uh, the majority of businesses have informal policies that allow people to infrequently work re remote. A lot of times it's kind of like, hey, you know, my, my child was sick or I'm taking a half day or I'm not feeling too well, I don't wanna come into the office. Uh, very few businesses uh, in political culture where there was flexible telework on a weekly or everyday basis. Um, but post COVID, we're looking at about 50% of businesses that are going to allow employees to work remote every day or most days. Uh, and what's really interesting to us is that 22% of respondents said they're unsure what that policy is going to look like. Um, and as we'll see later, I think a lot of those, a lot of that uncertainty is due to a lack of understanding about what public transportation options are going to look like. Um, people like taking public transportation. Historically, we've had really bad traffic, especially on some, a lot of our highways. So people don't love to drive in. Uh, parking is expensive. There's not a ton of availability. Um, and people typically like to work in an office. So we're seeing people that are interested in returning, uh, but they do want to know what capacity is look like, going to look like, what service is going to look like. And there hasn't been a great understanding of that so far. So that's where we think a lot of the uncertainty lies. Uh, next slide, please. So we asked businesses, and this is just from one representative, but we asked, we asked uh, what, how has the remote work experience been in your workplace? And it was pretty overwhelmingly positive, which was really encouraging. 80% said well or very well, and less than 3% reported having a poor or very poor experience. Um, so what that told us is that whether or not people like working from home, whether or not it uh, is a, as enjoyable in their minds, a lot of employers and employees are still able to get their work done from home. Um, and that is, that's really good information for us to have and really good information for us to highlight as people are deciding whether or not to return to the office during this time. Next slide, please. So we asked, um, we asked employers what changes they're, they're, they were considering in related to commuter benefits. Uh, overwhelmingly and, and quite clearly, employers are considering allowing people to continue working from home. Um, I think a lot of people have probably seen in the news that uh, large tech companies like Google, like Twitter, like Facebook, Amazon are really considering uh, not only through the remainder of this COVID period, but potentially long-term full-time telework options for employees. They've seen that um, this is an effective option. It eliminates the, uh, the congestion that they're causing in the cities. It eliminates the um, high trans uh, public transportation demands, and it really allows a lot of flexibility for their employees to, to work in a setting that's best for them. 
The second largest one, and this, is, this has been a really popular option, is introducing sk staggered schedules and flexible arrival times. So one thing that's very popular, uh, conceptually at least, is to have half your office commute one week, half your office commute the other week. That would be called like an AB schedule. Um, or allowing people to come in later so that they avoid peak times, they can still take public transportation. Um, we think that's a really great option, but um, making it organized, making it well thought out, as well as addressing some of the other concerns from returning to, to an office setting and the safety there is gonna be really important and uh, kind of goes into the overall thinking about, is it the right time to return to the office? And as you can see, the third highest one is unsure. There's still a lot of uncertainty um, amongst businesses of all sizes. They just, this is such an unprecedented time that uh, a lot of em employers are, are sort of like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of see what other people are doing. We're gonna model off of them. Or like, hey, Commute Seattle, could you tell us what to do? Uh, next slide, please. So then we asked employers what resources they would like more information on. And overwhelmingly, the first top two responses were transit related. And I think this is really telling. People would like to return to public transportation. They had a lot of employees on public transportation and they don't want to uh, encourage them to go back to that until they know that it's available and safe. Number one request was how do you ride transit safely? I think Metro and, and some of the other transit agencies have uh, put a lot of that information out online and on their social medias uh, and Community Seattle is really taking it upon ourselves to also um, absorb some of that information and pro provide it out to our following. Um, Repubs Transit service has been reduced. Capacity is going to be greatly reduced. Breaking that out and providing it to employers throughout the city, throughout the region is gonna be really valuable as they consider this return. Um, I think that also looking at it through an equity lens of we still have people that are transit dependent that are currently riding. And as people consider going back to the work, they have to consider whether or not just wanting to be in an office and return to the that co-working space is more important than potentially taking transit capacity away for the, from transit dependent individuals. Uh, a lot of questions around the guidance um, and what's going on, on the West Seattle Bridge. Um, we're really leaving that up to SDOT and supporting them in um, providing communications and support to West Seattle commuters and West Seattle businesses. Um, I believe we have a webinar coming up um, on that. It's going to be a part of our webinar series that we're working on. So if anyone's interested in that, please stay tuned on our website or follow up with me directly. Uh, the next biggest one is creating a return to work plan. And I think this is a really great thing to think about. Um, we had some open-ended questions in this survey that we just asked, what are people considering? And the lengths that a lot of employers are going to to make a, a safe work environment are incredible. Uh, it really shows how much people value not only the safety of their employees, obviously, but that that work environment. People really, the, the one of the number one challenges that people have faced is um, they really miss the interpersonal connections. They miss like the water cooler conversations, um, having that in-person collaborative uh, opportunities that an office allows and telework does not. Um, but commuting is only a part of the equation for returning to an office safely. People are, are talking about having everyone wear gloves and masks, only have half, their, half of their staff come in, um, extra cleaning, had, like having people test their temperature and things like that. And that we, we really ask people, are all of these steps necessary because you need to work from your office or just because you want to have a return to work plan? Um, and if telework is still working, is that a better option and are there ways to address some of the challenges that your your team has faced in the telework setting to improve that experience across the board as opposed to returning to your office. Um, we're really asking that question before we move forward with a, a in-depth return to the work plan. Um, and then the, the next highest one, which was really encouraging to us is remote, remote work is the new norm. A lot of employers and businesses have really come to the realization that we are not gonna return to the normal that we are experiencing at the end of last year. Um, we're not gonna return to the same options. Capacity on transit is not gonna be the same for a long time. Um, we don't have the highway space to have everyone return to work in a single occupancy vehicle. Figuring out 
parking options and parking demand downtown is going to be very challenging. And the easiest option is to continue teleworking um, and addressing any concerns that employees or, or teams are having any challenges technologically wise, et cetera. Um, so we, again, that's, that is uh, something that we're going to be addressing going forward and something that we're going to have uh, in a webinar se setting or maybe a, a, like a small business work group setting. Um, more on those options to come. And I think that's all for me and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions now or in the Q&A phase. Perfect. Thank you so much to everyone, to all of our panelists and all of our speakers. Again, uh, these are interesting times that we're living in. And I think that none of us would have, you know, expected or anticipated, you know, how these, you know, challenges have, have shifted so, so dramatically. And so I would love to start the conversation. Uh, we have a couple uh, questions that have come in. Um, and so again, pretty free form for the Q&A. People can just feel free to just, um, you know, start talking. And Bruce, I'm gonna ask you to kind of just help me facilitate a little bit. Um, but one thing that was touched on, you know, with all of the presentations, you know, was, you know, this idea of funding challenges, right? So, you know, there's only so many uh, funding sources um, and these funding sources their, you know, creative ideas that might be discussed, you know, within the transportation um, sectors, you know, for finding, you know, new revenue streams or, um, you know, maximizing, excuse me, existing, you know, options. Um, so open question kind of for everyone, funding challenges, um, you know, any new ideas or, or thoughts to help address that issue. I'm happy to try to start, <laughs> if you'd like. Um, the For both King County government and for Sound Transit as an agency, we're not able to raise new revenue without a vote of the public in any significant way. So that's not, a, the, the traditional method isn't a, a direct option. The legislature could give either the county to help fund Metro or Sound Transit to help fund Sound Transit. The legislature could choose to give counties or the transit authority new taxing authority to folks. I'm not sure that in this economic environment we're in, I don't know that voters would necessarily be supportive if something were put out there right now. Uh, clearly there's uh, an unmet need and I think public support for transit remains strong. We saw that in the recent, there was a statewide car tab vote. And although the vote to repeal car tabs passed statewide, it actually failed within the Sound Transit District, meaning a majority of the people who fund Sound Transit voted to continue funding it. Um, so it does require creativity and uh, the use of debt financing is one tool, um, but it's very limited and taking advantage of low interest rates to the extent the agencies can provides a little tiny bit uh, of breathing room. Um, fares are something that uh, are controlled by the public agencies. You can always charge more um, or look at your fare structure in some way. But the short answer is that for, to my knowledge, for both of those governments, King County, which runs Metro, and for Sound Transit, um, as an elected official who serves on both of those boards, there is not an option to consider that involves simply the elected officials choosing to raise taxes. It would involve a vote of the public or changes from the legislature. Perfect. Anyone else have, have anything to add about Funding, creative funding sources before I go on. We've got quite a few questions in the in the chat here. I would just add, Andrea, that uh, we're not likely to see a, a lot of help from the federal government. We've been talking infrastructure financing for three years and you can't seem to get a partisan, uh, bipartisan agreement. 
um, maybe after November, uh, we'll see. And the plans previous to COVID for a major state infrastructure um, program that Senator Hobbs had led the charge on is also its future is murky going into COVID with all the budget cuts and the economic impact to businesses. So I, I think Dave is absolutely right. You gotta kind of live with what your resources are today. Perfect, great, thank you so much. Uh, another question, uh, someone who says they have two cars that are just sitting in the driveway right now. They haven't been driven, you know, since March. Uh, you know, should they sell them and buy an electric bike? Uh, uh, or, you know, any advice on maybe, you know, uh, renegotiating with auto insurance? Um, so I guess that would maybe be a question we can start with you, Bruce. Uh, I know you've done a lot of, um, you know, work with electric, you know, all different kinds of electric vehicles um you know would that be a good option for someone or or what would that be a good option you know for someone who you know what their commute schedule might be well the the uh the jury is still out on on telecommuting i, I thought nick's uh data and survey was was very revealing and very helpful i i'd like to see that done with employers in south king county and the east side where the transit patterns are significantly different um, but I think it would may, maybe give us a uh, view of the future as to whether you need that vehicle or even that second vehicle. Um, the other thing that has kind of been lost in the shuffle uh, because of COVID is micro mobility. There's a whole body of work that because we've invested in transit centers, and so you, it, I live, for instance, in Beaux Arts Village, which is South Bellevue. And I have uh, remarkable access to local, the 550, uh, cross I-90, and local buses up to Kirkland and Redmond. Um, and some other communities have developed that, that connection to transit, making, the, making it walkable to get to transit centers. But as, as you get further out, a mile or two miles or three miles, you know, electric scooters, electric bikes, um, you know, little community shuttles, picking people up and dropping them off freeing up transit resources for high capacity routes, uh, hold great promise. And I've been really impressed. I personally have an electric bike, an old one, and the technology has gotten a lot better. Um, but they're a great way to commute. And, and you see that. Um, I just got back uh, from uh, a trip to New York City to see my family. And the entire city is devoid of uh, most of the, the cars and trucks, at least for the immediate COVID period and full of electric bikes delivering, you know, food and medicine, and all kinds of other things. So I think there's a bright future for electrified bikes and other micro mobility options. I'd like to chime in briefly also. I think that um, families and households with two cars should always consider whether they can get rid of one of those cars. Um, and right now with people resetting their commutes, um, it's probably as good a time as any. Transit is gonna continue to be a major presence throughout King County. We're gonna go through a rough patch here for a while, but certainly in the longer term, uh, one of our primary missions in the planning department at Metro at least is to make it possible for people to function with, fewer, uh, with either fewer cars or without a car. Yeah, I, I just will add quickly that um, I saw something online a few days ago that really stuck with me that um, bicycles are the new toilet paper. They're flying off the shelf. Sales are up like 200% nationally. Um, so obviously a lot of people are opting for that, both electric and and just regular bicycles. Um, Seattle had their Safe Street Initiative, which has been made permanent. I believe it's like 20 miles of um, car-free streets throughout the city. Um, hopefully they continue that and continue to build out the promised a connected bike network. Um, but with so many fewer vehicles on the roads throughout our region, now is really a great time to get more accustomed and comfortable with riding on, on the street and riding in the road and knowing which routes are going to be uh, available for you as a, as a, like quick commuting uh, options. Um, so I would really, I would encourage people to um, either go the electric route or also just like this is an opportunity to really try bicycling out as a commuting option and um, like great exercise. 
Perfect. Thank you. I know I have a 14 year old and a 10 year old and usually there's too much traffic for them to ride their bikes much around the neighborhood. And, you know, this has really been a great opportunity for them to, you know, uh, you know, buff up their bike skills, right. You know, cause they just, you know, have, have that opportunity. So I think that's a really good point. Uh, the next question, uh, how will the pandemic affect projects like the Puget Sound Gateway program and the 509 expansion? I know this, this is something that you know our chamber has worked on you know for over 10 years um, and there's a lot of concern again Bruce as you mentioned you know some of that funding you know is is federal funded right um, so I don't know if anyone has any any thoughts about uh, about the Puget Sound Gateway program or the 509 expansion that they want to share well I, I guess I would uh, chime in um, as I referenced before, we may see, depending on the results of the election in November, um, a major infrastructure plan. I, I just don't see the two parties coming together and with the administration um, before November. Uh, I know Congressman DeFazio in the, uh, in the House from Oregon is the chair of the House Transportation Committee. I've been on several webinars where he's basically said the same thing. But uh, long term, we may well have a major infrastructure plan as a way to uh, get people back to work. And you know, going back to President Obama's uh, um, shovel ready program uh, and stimulus uh, after the last economic downturn. And so I'm hopeful. And I think um, keeping those family wage jobs in and around trucking and the port and and the uh, small companies that that benefit from international trade and the position of Seattle and Tacoma as a gateways, those are very, very important jobs to keep. And um, this is a good time while we're resetting priorities um, and traffic is uh, less congested to double our commitment to completing our infrastructure and making sure that when the economy, the global economy comes back, that we don't have bottlenecks to the smooth flow of uh, goods and, and services in and out of our ports. Dave, did you have something that you wanted to add? No, I, I haven't seen the exact numbers, but I know that the gas tax revenue that the state uses to, as a central part of funding these projects is also, like the sales tax, is down significantly, and that the state is having to reevaluate their construction activities as a result. That program is critical. I mean, that's a connection. Um, that is going to keep our region economy or our region economically competitive having that um connection from the port of tacoma south access to the airport the ability to get freight off of i-5 to go to duwamish is is absolutely essential for our region that um if we're going to be able to compete with the other ports on the west coast we need to move forward with that project and i know it has support in the legislature but how I think it will rise and fall just as all the construction projects rise and fall based on the ability of the legislature to um, adjust their programs or find uh, additional sources of revenue to plug those holes. But I know there, uh, I, I didn't come with state stats, but I know there's a big hole in the state transportation budget due to um, its reliance on the gas tax. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. So this is a this is a question that allows us to, you know, think five or 10 years into the future. Um, but again, you know, what will the future look like five or 10 years, you know, from now? Uh, what will the the long term kind of lasting impacts of the pandemic be? You know, for example, as Nick mentioned, you know, will more of us try out these bike routes um, and just abandon our cars entirely? Um, will we be able to think about more, you know, autonomous self-driving cars? I know, Bruce, when, you know, we did our event in Des Moines, there's a lot of conversation about autonomous shuttle service and autonomous buses and autonomous, you know, trucks for, you know, supply chain and, and logistics purposes. Um, do we think that the pandemic is going to, you know, uh, maybe set the pace a little faster for some of those things, or do you think it might slow it down? Well, I, I think, um, and it's a question I raised at the beginning, uh, the connection between COVID and climate change, and particularly the negative impact on low-income communities around our ports, our airport, our seaports, 
from diesel emissions makes a very compelling argument for accelerating electrification and um, whether it's public transit or delivery vehicles or Uber, Lyft or airport shuttles or taxis, whatever. I think the other point that I alluded to um, is the need for a major public and private commitment to digital infrastructure. Um, what we're finding from telecommuting and some of the problems the CL school district has faced in trying to get students uh, access to online education when they don't have an internet access or a hotspot, we need to increase the commitment to lay more fiber down and, and go to fi faster speeds that make cities smarter and freight move better. Um, and that means 5G and in the future 6G. And uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, by Eric Schmidt from Google uh, calling on the president and the, the rest of the country to align with industry employers to make those investments in digital infrastructure, whether it's for uh, you know, what we're doing now or telehealth, providing healthcare to rural areas or, or education and equal access for students online. Digital infrastructure is part of it and um, what it can do to benefit citizens is, is particularly uh, um, a need for a focus of, of us um, at the national and local level. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, go, Nick. Thanks, Bill. Um, so I, I really appreciate Bruce's response. I thought that was really um, thoughtful. Uh, I think telecommuting potentially coming out of COVID could be an absolute game changer. Uh, I think the culture around it, especially in, in a corporate setting with, you know, old school executives where if you can't see your employees working, how do you know if they're doing anything? Um, we could see a pretty significant shift from that uh, nationwide, culturally, especially in our region, especially in some of the really big industries such as tech. Um, I also just wanted to say that there is a lot of uh, planned light rail expansion in the next 10 years that's really going to change the way that our region moves. Um, we're gonna see light rail expanding north, expanding Federal Way, expanding to the east side, um, and hopefully expanding to West Seattle. Um, and I know that there have been discussions about expediating that with the West Seattle Bridge failing. I'm um, creating a connected network of bus routes, of um, shuttles, both employees and maybe um, like private mobility partnering with transit agencies, as well as a connected bike network and walkable uh, areas so that people can connect to these fast um, transportation networks is really going to drastically shift the way that this region uh, moves. Yeah, and just adding just a little bit to Nick and Bruce's really comprehensive comments, um, on the more on the bus and rail transit side, more on the bus side, you know, King County Metro and the other bus agencies are going to really need to reset and re-examine the networks that we provide, as well as the way we provide service, the efficiency with which we provide the service. Um, and I believe that as we come into a new reality over a period of years, which really begins with the vaccine, when people can be fully comfortable getting back on public transit, you know, whether that is in the neighborhood of a year out, nobody knows. But um, when that last barrier to returning to public transit is removed, I think you will still see that flattening curve as a result of telecommuting. Uh, and that's the demand curve for really for any kind of transportation, but specifically for uh, transit and really bus transit in King County. And so that'll give us a chance to refocus some of that service to other hours of the day, the weekend, to the night, to the midday. And the riders that are commuters that we lose permanently because they're telecommuting, which is great, um, we need to get those back during other times of day. And that will allow us to implement that equity lens to further serve populations that need us more while still you know, providing a quality service that keeps our percentage of choice ridership up in that 70%, 80% range. So it's a huge set of challenges, but it's also a great opportunity to provide better service around the clock and throughout the week. 
Andrea, can I add a, a final thought? Absol absolutely, please. And I'm going to wax philosophical a little bit more than details. Uh, being an elected official is the democratic processes aren't set up well for quick systemic changes. Uh, there's checks and balances and for good reason. But there's obviously lots of discussion going on, not just among elected officials, but I think in people's homes and around their dinner tables with their families about, you know, will there be a quote unquote new normal? Are we going back to the way things were? And I think when you were essentially stuck at home alone for weeks on end, you do lots of thinking as an individual when you and your family are together and disconnected. There's a lot of self-reflection that takes place among individuals about what's important in, in, in your life. What do you value as a person and what do you want out of your community and your future? There's also, I think, a sense more than ever of being connected to one another, even globally. I remember watching as these cases were springing up in all these small countries around the world or watching the folks in Italy and saying, now we're going through this. There's a sense that we're all connected on one big crazy planet. And so I think there are opportunities. You know, they, there's an old cliche crisis, opportunity and crisis to look at big picture structural changes um, around things like climate policy, uh, tax policy, how we deliver human services. This pandemic has really exacerbated and, and, and laid bare existing inequalities. And um, do we have the ability as a community, as a nation, to envision a different future? And kind of at that bigger philosophical level. And I, it's very challenging. Uh, we're a very divided nation. Um, people's priorities and values vary to such a degree that that's hard and our, our system isn't set up for it. But I think anyone in elected office and anyone who's a civic leader uh, would be crazy not to be thinking about how do we take advantage of a moment in order to make positive change for the community. And um, the examples the previous speakers gave were all, you know, some specific where we might see those changes, but I think it can, you know, I think this has struck, this health pandemic has struck people in a very real and personal way in the way other things in our lives haven't, that history is going to look back on this moment and we're going to say we were, we were alive during the, the, the 2020 coronavirus pandemic and, and what does our world look like afterwards? So. No, I, I appreciate that, Council Member. I know we had similar conversations when we did our virtual education and workforce summit about, you know, there are these these things, these structural systems that, you know, uh, the status quo would never even anticipate, uh, you know, thinking about changing, like, you know, year-round school or, um, you know, what does, what does attendance really mean? A little bit you know, to the other question about like, well, if I can't see you doing the work, you know, how do I know you're really doing the work, right? And so it, it does bring up a lot of those, you know, philosophical, you know, shifts of, you know, maybe school does look different and maybe learning doesn't just happen in a classroom and it doesn't just happen, you know, 845 to 315, Monday through Friday, September through June, right? So I think it's a, it is a really exciting opportunity to think about lots of different, you know, structural shifts um, and changes that can happen within our community. So thank you, appreciate that. A uh, couple other questions. And so again, just to remind everyone, if you do have a question, uh, you can type it into the comment section on Facebook, or you can type it into the chat or the Q&A here uh, on the Zoom webinar. Um, so please do get those questions in. I have two other questions, and then um, if we don't have any other questions, I'll open it up for just some final thoughts. Um, this question might be a little bit more directed towards, um, you know, Bill, but it's, again, it's a question about safety with public transportation, right? So there's been some reports on the news of um, bus drivers and other metro workers getting sick with COVID, um, and, you know, the question of, you know, our, our, how are buses, you know, being, you know, maintained and cleaned and, and, and high, you know, hygienic. Um, so, you know, can we safely, uh, confidently, you know, ride public transit today? That's kind of the question of the day. 
Um, and I mean, obviously safety is for both our employees and our customers is the absolute top priority, which is why we were led so quickly to reduce the capacity um, on our buses as Nick showed. Um, and, and as I discussed, sounds like I have an animal I might need to evict here. Um, <laughs> But I hope it's not. I'm glad you. I'm glad you said it was an animal, Bill, because I have been thinking it was a child this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can pick. You can quick. pick up. You can pick up the cat. <laughs> um, so uh, our buses are cleaned and disinfected every day. Um, all of our operators are wearing masks. The reason we stopped collecting fares immediately was because we wanted to keep customers away from drivers and vice versa. Um, and we've more recently marked off seats. Uh, we, we are showing on the bus, for those of you who have been on the bus recently, you've noticed that we're providing this visual cue of where people can and can't sit. Um, all that said, uh, you know, until there's a vaccine and until the prevailing thinking nationally and on, on a statewide and countywide basis, starts to permit people to be in closer proximity to each other, um, you know, we're not gonna be back to that normal feeling of safety. The, um, I guess I'd just add that right now, transit is for, is for essential trips. And essential is subjective, but we are um, essentially not ready to welcome everybody back yet. And we really are looking forward to that day when we can do that. One thing I might add about that is uh, it's also really important to consider the safety of the destination. Um, from a commuting standpoint, uh, office environments are going to be really tricky. Um, you have a lot of office buildings, you're going to have lobbies with large groups of people. Elevators are an incredibly sticky situation. There's no way to socially distance and people are using those up and down every single day. Um, in just a, a shared office environment with your coworkers, how, how do you safely socially distance? What do you do about kitchens, bathrooms, lobbies, hallways, um, shared work equipment? Um, and what do you do when you have a building that doesn't have functioning open windows and you have a closed air ventilation system? There's a ton of questions around how do you make the destination safety safe as well. So while the, the transportation is clearly a huge part and that's what we're talking about today, um, you do have to factor in all of the different parts of this safety equation. Perfect, again, thank you so much. Uh, and then I think this is just our final question uh, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit. So it might be a good you know, final thought you know, for everyone to kind of go around with um, but what segments of transportation might actually advance due to the COVID-19 pandemic? So we've talked a lot about challenges and, you know, and decreases, um, but, you know, where, where might we see the advances being made? And again, we, we like to, you know, leave on a positive note, right? Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I think, uh, as I referenced before, uh, we're likely to see uh, accelerated um, autonomy and connected vehicles in the freight and supply chain sector because um, it's immediate, uh, it's urgent. Um, a lot of talk about robot deliveries and, and, uh, and freight moving um, uh, into even on a like a large campus like uh, Amazon distribution center, you could have uh, autonomous forklifts and and robots delivering um, goods around and and separating workers. Um, I, I think we're also going to see again. This depends on the length of this pandemic. If it comes back, COVID comes back in the in the fall and winter, and the vaccine stretches out, um, we, we might see some permanent permanent uh, adjustments in the idea of separating a, a driver from a passenger or a customer. And, and this is what we see with Uber and Lyft cutting back on their shared rides. Um, uh, you, you just want to have a protection area around your customers. And so I think it's going to it's going to raise the question of autonomous operations and probably more 
foundationally uh, connected communities through, as I said, internet um, speed improvements for the ability to provide jobs and, and retraining, which has got to be a very important part to get workers back to work in new jobs, different jobs. So I think the jury's still out, but um, there are some early trends. I will only say that I would never uh, second guess Bruce on forward thinking, innovative, uh, <laughs> predicting where transportation is going. So I, I, uh, uh, I, I can't add anything to that, uh, but as a closing thought, um, the importance that the Sound Transit Capital Program is going to play in terms of a major public works project in our region to help stimulate this economy as we come out of this, I think can't be understated. And the importance of transit in general to folks who are truly are dependent. What do we see, like 20 some percent of, of Washington residents have filed for unemployment. Um, the devastation that small business owners are feeling, there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to need transit and to be able to get around. So um, I think the work that um, our public transit system is doing is going to not only provide an economic stimulus, but is going to provide a necessary economic safety net uh, for all of us as we uh, climb out of this. And hopefully we can, as I rambled on about in my previous answer, I think we've all thought in our lives about what's important to us and that we can create a future that's more reflective of those, those values that we do hold near and dear. I'm gonna get really optimistic here and say that I think equitable environmental transportation planning will advance. Um, we'll see that there are people that are willing to do active commuting as we can already see on a national level just based on bike sales um, as we can see um, anecdotally around the greater Seattle area. Um, we'll see that there is a greater need for a robust protected um, bike network um, not just in downtown Seattle but throughout Seattle that allows people to choose that as a commuting mode to their place of business. Um, I also think we'll see uh, through this experience where a lot of our um, transit dependent individuals are and that those are in um, lower socioeconomic areas that are previously underserved by transit and hopefully we'll be able to reallocate some of the transit service to those area areas to greater serve them as well as provide them with maybe some other multimodal options uh, first last mile solutions that can get them to those transit centers um, and hopefully we'll be able to look at this through uh, environmental equity lens and continue to plan for the future where we have this connected network that serves everyone equally and provides people with a plethora of options so that they aren't just dependent on a vehicle. They aren't just dependent on one mode, but they have a multitude of options to get anywhere within our region. Just a couple quick thoughts. Those are all excellent thoughts. Um, you know, Metro has continued to operate throughout this crisis. Um, we're providing some sense of continued normalcy. Um, the buses are still out there. They're serving well over 100,000 passengers per day. Um, these are people who need to get where they're going. Uh, and what I see coming out of this in terms of Metro's role in the transportation network is that we're going to come out of it stronger. Uh, we will be smaller for a while, hopefully for a shorter time and not a longer time. But we will by necessity have come through this um, successfully. And we're going to use the opportunity to reset our role in the community and to continue to be that, um, that service that's out there for everybody that's safe for everybody, that uh, provides adequate convenience for everybody. And I think that, you know, the, the, a nexus between sustainability and transportation and this pandemic um, is starting to clarify where the pandemic is bringing some of the sustainability needs around climate change into larger focus. 
um, and Metro is going to continue to have a big role in that. Perfect. Great. Well, again, I really appreciate you know everyone being here uh, this morning and going into this afternoon to just you know talk about you know what does the future of transportation look like and provide such you know key uh, industry perspectives. Perspectives. Uh, we are now in King County officially, you know, in modified, you know, phase one uh, of the Safe Start Washington, right, which, you know, means that, you know, we are going to start to see, uh, you know, people coming back and, you know, looking at, you know, what those changes to their commute and transportation, um, you know, systems are uh, and it's an important opportunity for us just to, you know, as has been mentioned before, um, just do a do a level check and and think about, you know, how can we create, you know, more equity and and more access and more sustainability, you know, throughout our whole transportation infrastructure system. So again, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk with you all uh, and to also engage our community. Uh, we hope that you join us next Friday uh, when we come and talk about immigrant and minority impacts that have happened due to COVID. Again, really appreciate the opportunity to connect. Uh, we are still connecting, we are still convening, we are still creating opportunity here at the Chamber. Uh, it might look a little different these days than how it normally does, uh, but you know our mission remains true. Uh, to connect, convene, and create opportunity for South King County. So again, thank you to everyone who joined us uh, and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you and take care. Stay safe.